Hi, uh, my name is Teresa Price, and this is Nanette Modiam, and we work at St. Michael's Clinic in uh, Anniston, Alabama. And we're going to present to you a talk today called Small Clinic, Big Impact. And one of the reasons we decided to uh, present this talk is because we've been to a lot of these conferences, and we know that there's a lot of big clinics here, and some of the, the talks really kind of pertain to big clinics, big budgets, and you kind of feel left out if you're a small clinic. And so we wanted to show, just share some tips for those of you who might be a small clinic like us. Like to show you how to leverage your resources to best help your patients. In other words, how to use the little that you have to go um, the farthest yeah. and to help the most. Yeah, so St. Michael's Medical Clinic was started in 1988. It was started by the Church of St. Michael's and All Angels in Anniston. Uh, and they really did it with, with a heart to help the community and maintained it very much like a church ministry for many years. They had one volunteer and um, one um, primary provider. Uh, they did that with... Um, uh, nurse practitioners over the years. And so when, when I, when I came, that's kind of where the clinic was at. Um, they supplied the, the free lease of this building here that's pictured and it was right across the street from the church. And I started in 2014 and I, as the first ever executive director, because basically before that it was run really like a church ministry. So they had volunteers from the church who basically ran kind of the front desk. And then they had one provider who basically kind of did every Thing. And so when I got there, they realized that they needed to um, really uh, may, may, maybe become more of a professional medical clinic um, that still kept the heart of ministry, but also uh, would, would really start to uh, prove their success in order to raise money and also to get grant funding and, and so that it would be sustainable in the future. Um, Teresa started in 2015. And um, and really, I, I, I would say in all honesty that I'm sitting here because Teresa started in 2015. Um, you really have to have people in this kind of ministry who feel called to this kind of work. And Teresa um, is really called to be a provider with a heart for Jesus for our patients. And so she's critical to our success and in making an impact for our patients' lives. So um, you, you have to have the right people and you have to trust that God will send those to you if um, this is what you're called to do. So the first thing we did in that little building that we had, which was, I would say, about 3,000 square feet, is we started to leverage our space. When we first got there, it was a really, that that building was basically a basically about 3,000 square feet that was split in half. And one was a side was a meeting room and one side was three small exam rooms, an office and a front desk and a little tiny waiting area. And it just didn't take very long before we realized we needed a larger waiting area. Um, I needed an office outside of the clinic um, and we needed workspaces for our volunteers. And so probably over the years, we first split up the other half um, and made um, a a, a supply room, two offices, actually three offices, and um, a workspace that kind of was all, it's kind of always the junkie space to tell you the truth. Um, it would just end up being, you know, part, part, you know, COVID testing for a couple of years. And, you know, on the other end of the table, unfortunately, you might have somebody eating their lunch. So, um, but we did, we maximized our space. Um, so sometimes you might need to think about tearing walls down or putting walls up, what space do you have and where can you put the maximum amount of volunteers and get the most done? Uh, another thing that we really realized that we were going to have to do is to try to eventually go paperless. And I know a lot of small clinics still use paper charts, but I, I would so encourage you um, to make a shift towards electronic health records just because they're so much more efficient. Um, I do recognize that they 
they don't hold a lot of data that a small clinic that's a nonprofit needs. Um, so you're gonna um, sometimes, what we use is practice fusion, but at the same time, I recognize that it doesn't hold your eligibility. So we still do have paper charts for eligibility, but probably by the end of this year, we will also go digital for that. And so, um, in, in trying to, to really cut down, we, we digitized our faxing um, uh, this year, and that has also really cut down on paper for us. And paper takes up space. So if space is a problem for you in a small clinic, I would really encourage you um, for all the advantages there are to going to use an EHR. And if you have some providers that are a little reluctant, I I was scared of EHR when I came. I'd been in Haiti for 12 years. We were definitely using paper charts there. And uh, so all my practice had been on paper and I was nervous, but I'm it, it was an easy learning curve. You can pick programs. Like we, we have Practice Fusion, which is very user friendly. It, it's just been, I, it's what I prefer now to paper. So even if you have those that are a little bit um, reticent mm -hmm. to to start it, if, if you just make the push, we have one volunteer who is in her, well into her seventies. And when we went paperless with our faxing, she was also really nervous about it and she, she's doing great. And so you just got to make them do it and and they'll they'll roll with it. Yeah, the the learning curve can be um uh, tough sometimes, but once you get people past the the reluctance, um there's almost always, you know, full support of it at, at that point. You'll especially find this for the person who does your medical records request that they'll like it a lot. <clears throat> okay, so we ha we have to leverage our talent pool. They, these this is the folks that work with us. The lady there on the end in the blue um, is a 25 year volunteer. She predates me. Um, she's been our bookkeeper um, for many years, but she was one of those people that started out at the front desk. And when I first started, I realized she doesn't like the front desk. And so I said to her, you know, what do you want to do? And she said, I just want to do medical records and bookkeeping. And then I said, well, then let's get you off the front desk because people, especially volunteers, they don't need to do jobs that they don't like to do um, because you don't get the most out of them. Um, uh, the next lady in line, her name is Kathy and Kathy came to us as a volunteer to work the front desk as well. But it turns out she was a retired pharmacist and she was so much better at managing our medications than me or Teresa were. And so she really moved into that role. So, you know, the, the people you need and God sends them to you. So you just have to be willing to work with them and maybe, um, and maybe adjust to who they are and what their personalities are um, and where they might should be. Um, the next guy um, came to us as a medical student Student. He's our lone male employee at the moment. So first one on the end is a volunteer, full time, uh, you know, for many years volunteer. Um, the rest of them are um, our, our permanent staff. So Norwood there in the middle came to us as a pre-PA student and uh, came as a volunteer, worked quite a long time as a volunteer. And we, um, we really found, and we've consistently found this to be true, that pre-med and pre-PA students make your best medical tech, um, your, your best medical assistant. And that's because they're really, really invested in learning more um, and being a part of your clinic because it, it furthers their future, um, it, fur it furthers their passion. And, um, and they're nor a lot of them are in gap years waiting to get into their advanced practice programs. And so we just can't recommend that enough that students can make really good committed volunteers. They saved us during the COVID year so much when many of our seniors were um, pushed out because for their own safety. And we we just found a, a large success with pre-med, pre-PA, pre any sort of um, uh, future medical um, degree science that, that all of them will be good for you. Uh, we regularly have nurse practitioner students here, um, undergrad um, um, BSN students. And so uh, you want to say yes to students as much as you can, because hopefully it also puts in them a heart for medicine in the future for vulnerable populations. So um, it, it, we've, we've really found great success in that and highly recommend it. Um, the next lady is a retired school teacher. And then Myra on the end, we got her out of a professional relationship. I have a, I have a professional relationship that I got um, <clears throat> 
through our local chamber of commerce. And I found out that there was a school that was training phlebotomists and med techs. And um, I was looking for a bilingual um, uh, med tech. And so uh, this, this because of that professional relationship in the community, um, we were able to find Myra. So um, just, it's always about um, really cultivating relationships in order to um, find the people that you need. <clears throat> And then I want to encourage those that are clinicians to use your skill set to the fullest. I know that a lot of us learned how to suture in school, but maybe we haven't done it for years. Um, learned some ortho, some simple casting, splinting, uh, reading x-rays, but just haven't used it. Uh, even I find providers who have, you know, oh, I did gyne back in the day, but I, I haven't done that for a long time. If you learned it in school, refresh yourself and use it. Just um, practice to the fullest of your capacities. Try to take a holistic approach to the patient in front of you. What is what is the maximum I can do for this patient? What is the comprehensive care that I can give this patient here without referring them out? Because transportation is an issue, money is an issue. And so the more you can do for them legally um, and responsibly in your clinic, the better. So if you learned it once, refresh yourself and 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 keep doing it. Do it in clinic. And then along with what Nanette has said about you know making connections and using those connections to your benefit, what what I find is nice as a PA, I'm a I'm a PA, um, is that I can ask a doctor a question. They'll they'll be glad to answer me. I know sometimes an MD might feel a little bit uh, more ashamed maybe to ask a colleague a question thinking, well, maybe they'll think I need to know that anyway. But I, I don't find that that should be true or is true for the majority of life. If you'll swallow your pride and say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing here. Can you help me? There's a lot of people who are willing to help you out. And that's really saved us some referrals. And it, and you know, our patients can't pay. In our town, it takes $250 just to put your toe in the office of an orthopedist and neurology as well, $200. So a lot of our patients, it's just beyond them to go to these uh, specialists. So what I found is my friends who are doctors in town or people that I've just met in town or that I've had as my own providers, I just say, hey, can I have your number? Would you mind if I called you if I ran across a problem and just kind of got your idea on this? Because I see these vulnerable people that without insurance, they could really um, use some help and might not be able to afford to go to you. And a lot of them have said yes. And I found that a lot of them even, you know, are very glad to pick up that phone when I call. Um, orthopedics, for instance, we have a relationship with them where I can text the ortho and say, look up this x-ray on, because, because we share a program that accesses the same x-rays that are done at the hospital. I said, you know, I've got this patient in my office. They say they were at the ER, the ER splinted it told them to go to ortho, they can't afford ortho. Can you look at their x-ray for me and tell me what to do with it? And so they'll tell me, you know, yeah, that that needs casted, that needs a short leg or or that needs, you know, a short arm cast or whatever it needs. They'll tell me and for how long, and then I can go ahead and do that in the office, bring them back, order PT. Or they might say, no, that has to, to be surgically fixed. And then in that case, we have to try to find a way to get our patients um, to them. Yeah. And, but, but it does save us a lot. It does save our patients a lot of referrals where they would have had to pay that $250, $500 just to be told, yeah, keep the cast on for six weeks. Uh, rheumatology. I do a lot of, I, I see a lot of rheumatoid arthritis, um, systemic lupus, that kind of thing. And we can do a lot of treatment of that right in the office. It, don't be afraid to start DMARDs, especially the easy ones like Plaquenil and um, at the track site, you just, as long as you have a way to check their labs and they're going to be consistent with coming for their labs and you have a way to do a, a baseline fundoscopic exam, uh, and then if I have patients who are, they're failing their DMARDs, they're not doing well, they can't tolerate them, I'll call the rheumatologist, I'll text her and say, hey, 
can you see this patient, maybe start them on a biologic, and then they only have to pay for the one visit, and then we can continue doing the labs, we can, we can continue monitoring them, they might only have to go once a year. To, to rheumatology that way. So it, it'll save them. And all of the, all the, like I said, these specialists are more than willing to, to work with that. We uh, deal with hep C at our clinic because the local clinic that was dealing with all of the hep C and treating it, they lost their grant funding for it. And so Nanette, who is uh, our grant writer, found us some grant funding for it. And we found an, uh, an infectious disease doc at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, who was willing to consult with me and spend time educating me on hep C treatment and what's new in the field and what they need. And um, so now we uh, think in our county, we're the one of the only ones that are that are treating hep C. And so we have hundreds of, of patients that we've screened for hep C and treated for hep C. So don't be afraid to branch off into those kinds of things. I've even had a had a patient with I, I treated a lot of TB in Haiti, but um, here I actually had a patient with uh, tuberculosis as well. And you know, of course, you have to involve the the uh, public health and your your local uh, health department and all of that. But infectious disease was more than willing to consult me on that as well. Um, endocrine, sometimes you get a complicated diabetic case, um, or you can even get into those things, you know, the, we have hyperthyroidism. I know a lot of times in primary care, you refer that out, you can treat that. And, and then if you're having troubles, if you think they need radiate, um, radioactive iodine, go ahead and send them to endo. But you, hyperparathyroidism, same thing. I've um, had the endocrine advise me on what to do with the hypercalcemia involved there. And so if, if you're, if you know, a little bit about the disease process and how it's treated, but you just need that added um, information and expertise. Just call, call your friends, call your, um, call the specialist that you should have on speed dial, and don't bug them too much. But for for the interesting mm -hmm. cases, they're always willing to talk about it because they see a lot of the mundane every day, and so the interesting stuff there they're glad to talk to you about. And then I just wanted to encourage you not to be afraid of psych. When I came, the woman uh, to St. Michael's. The previous provider had said no schizophrenics, no bipolar. I won't treat this. I won't treat that. She's a whole whole list of things she wouldn't treat. And if you're going to be in um, a free and charitable clinic setting, you're going to see a lot of psych. And so take take continuing education classes. Remember what you learned at school. Uh, take more classes to learn what's the newest and latest. And don't be afraid to to treat these people. They they need someone to someone who's a Christian, someone who will pray with them, someone who will treat them gently and kindly and as, as um, um, one of God's creatures and, and, and they need help. Most of them are not looking to give you troubles. They're, they're just looking for help. We, we have quite a few who are um, just begging to be put on medicine. A lot of them have been just released from jail. They can't get into mental health services for another couple of months. They, they ran out of their meds and they're going to go straight back to jail behavior wise unless they get their medicine and, and they know it and, and they just want help. So, of course, we are referring these people to um, counseling and to psychiatry. But in the meantime, don't be afraid to fill that gap and to address psychological needs, because if you're going to do holistic medicine, you you have to do psychiatry and psychology as well. So here, I just want to say again, probably this is where it's important to leverage relationship. You know, like we, we, we have to trust that there are good um, specialists out there. Um, they want to help. In fact, a lot of times what I have found in speaking with some of the specialists that help us is that they are seeing the uninsured in their office. Somehow they came to them maybe via, you know, a hospital um, referral and, um, and so they don't know where to get their medicines from. They don't know how to get their labs at a discounted rate. They don't know how to get these things. And so what I have found is I've been able to kind of sell our services, like let us help the primary care aspect. If you will continue to treat them as a specialist, we can take care of the things that are really not 
you know, your, your, your infectious disease doctor doesn't want to handle their hypertension, you know, so, you know, let, let us handle the primary care aspects. So, you know, just don't be afraid to do the networking. Um, it, it might take going out to an evening meeting. It might, it might take, um, professional, um, uh, classes to go to, to, to maybe not just learn, but also to network. So, you know, just don't, don't be afraid to, um, to make friends and to reach out and to believe that God really does have other people who really want to help you. Uh, and then there's new skills that you can learn. Uh, joint injections is one. Each state has their own mandates and recommendations for mid-levels, uh, but you can you can learn how to do those joint injections and really save them in an orthopedic visit there. Uh, removing toenails, we do that a lot. We do a lot of incision and drainage of abscesses here. Uh, what we haven't done, but we could do is uh, wet mounts. You can get your um, a microscope and do those right in your office. We've done uh, point of care ultrasound. I had done that in Haiti and I pitched it to Net one year. I said, I really like an ultrasound machine. I used it in Haiti and loved it. And, and do you think we can do that here? And so she sent me, she wrote the grant, got the, the, got the grant to pay for the machine and for my education, sent me down to a class. And actually one of my uh, covering physicians went with because he was jealous that I'd be learning something he didn't know. So we both went and learned point of care ultrasound for primary care, mostly abdominal, little pelvic, little thyroid and, and um, little scrotum, you know, just, just your basics for primary care. And it helps avoid so many um, uh, unnecessary referrals, you know, if you can just say, well, this, this isn't this or this is an emergency. It, it really helps. And so I've got some on this next slide here, some websites, I believe. Yeah. And we'll show them to you. And, but I just want to point out that this, this is probably one of the key points. If we could really make any key point is that think comprehensive care. We're, we're trying to be a primary care office that practices to the edge of the scope of practice that we can, because we know that if we do it here for them, that it gets done, that, that we, that it's time and money and effort that patients just don't have. And, and so us doing it here means that it gets done. The great thing about our ultrasound is because we're not billing for it is we just roll it in. If it needs to be used, it's not can we get approval? Is it okay? And, you know, really in the beginning, it started out as a screening ultrasound, but really more because the Teresa skills have gotten so much better. It's more diagnostic than it ever has been. So we have more confidence in our diagnosis and our treatment and any point of care tests that you can do, um, that you can afford to do and do with in-house, those help. So, you know, get your point of care. And those are things that grant funders like to pay for. Um, you the can, one and done. Yeah, it's a one and done. And you can really make a case for those and you can really um, make a big impact for your patient's health. Some uh, websites that might be helpful. Gulf Coast Ultrasound Institute is where I went to get training on point of care ultrasound. They're great. They'll ask you what machine you have and they'll make sure one of those machines is on site. It's only a couple of, you can go for a whole week, but there's also ones that are just on the weekend or just a couple of days. So it really fits in with your professional schedule. You do have to go. They, they do have um, online classes, but I would recommend the in-person class because they have um, live models there that you can practice on. And the teachers are right there telling you whether your technique is, is correct or needs tra uh, needs changed. Their, their courses range anywhere from 4,000 to 2,400. I mean, 400 to 2,400, depending on what you're looking at. And so that, like I said, can be written into a grant ahead of time is the travel there, the stay and the, and, and the learning as well as your machine. And I don't really remember how much our machine was, but those also have a wide range. Depending yeah. Very on wide range. They can be from 5,000 to, you know, well, you know, hundreds of thousands, but I think ours was maybe, it was less than 20,000. It's been quite a, quite a number of years since we bought it now, but it, Maybe around fifteen thousand, I think it was. And we haven't had to service it mm -hmm. much. No, it's, 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 it's uh, really been a hardy yeah. machine. The yeah. ones I used in Haiti were exceptionally hardy, but they were small, and their their screen was small. They were military grade, so you can really get any. Um, yeah, shop range. Around. Yeah, um, we've tried PFTs here in the office before, and I was actually looking for for this talk, researching some that were a little better than the one we had. We had an office based PFT that just 
it required too much uh, calibration and ain't nobody got time for that. Somebody and donated it to us. So uh, <laughs> there are some that don't need calibrated that are a lot easier to use and the uh, mouthpieces aren't too expensive. Again, with these kinds of things like PFTs, you'll, you'll have to, there's going to be that, that um, cost that's going to be monthly just based on how many you do and how many different um, interchangeable pieces you're using. But PFDs can be very uh, useful to do in an office setting just to say, hey, yep, you do have COPD. I thought so because you smoked for 20 years, but now we know. And mm -hmm. this is what we're going to treat. And, we, and you can avoid the, the terminology referral. Uh, point of care labs, we use a lot of HemoQ. Um, and then we also use a DCA Vantage analyzer for our A1C. So we're in in-house, we're doing urine pregnancy, we're doing urine dips, we're doing hemoglobins, WBCs, um, A1Cs. We can do uh, the rapid testing of the strep and the mono, they fluid have COVID. the flu and COVID, they've got rapid uh, testing for uh, HIV out there and for other STDs as well, if, you're, if your local health department isn't doing it. So it's good to have to have quite a few things right there in house that and and it's it doesn't it as long as you're writing it into your grants it's mm -hmm. it's been able to be funded pretty easily. And then another thing we were offered at uh, the last conference we were at was called a Visual DX app for uh, the for your phone as a clinician and this really helps with derm any kind of um, dermatology. You can actually take a picture of your patient and then load it up in there and it'll tell you the, the likely diagnoses. And then of course with derm, you know, don't be afraid of biopsy. That's what the dermatologists mm -hmm. will do anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They'll throw steroids at it. And if it doesn't respond, they'll biopsy it. So don't, don't be afraid to, um, to biopsy your derm. And then uh, just the legal ramifications for mid-levels. Another way to leverage your talent pool is to use mid-levels, obviously, mm -hmm. right? You're not going to get a lot of doctors who are going to want to work for what you can afford to pay them. But you might find um, mid-levels that mm -hmm. you can either afford to pay or that are willing to work for what you can afford. So uh, just remember, if it's in the scope of care of the collaborating physician, then you can do it as a mid-level. So, you know, if you, it's, it's that's really broad. And I was, each state is different. I was reading Alabama because that's where we uh, practice, but really that was basically the definition of what uh, the, what a PA can do in Alabama as well. If your, if your clinician does it, if it's in their scope of care, then you can too. Now, of course, um, some might need to be requested ahead of time, but we had to say, you know, can I, can I do joint injections? And then you've got to, you've got to, there's a process involved in some of those. And, and, some, and you usually have to tell them ahead of time what you're going to be doing, let the state know. But uh, as long as they, they know, mm -hmm. then, then you can do it. So, um, yeah. Uh, the, the thing I want to say here is that um, I really am invested in the mid-level model. So if you're a physician in this room um, listening to this, it's, it's uh, no offense. Um, it's just that we know that um, very much the future of primary care is very much probably in the hands of mid-levels. Um, we can afford them. And I, I know that many clinics are, are based on a volunteer physician or maybe a series of volunteer physicians and specialist. Um, but the way that we run, we run a Tuesday through Friday clinic, eight to four. So it's consistent every week. And because we've been able to hire a mid-level, it's so she's not a volunteer there. When, when you're, when you're not a volunteer, there is some sort of obligation of showing up, you know, Tuesday through Friday. So, um, it, it is different than a volunteer role. And then there is a continuity of care. And this is what's most important to me is that when the patients come, they're not retelling their story. They're seeing the same person nearly every single time. Um, they're seeing many of the same people. This is even true of our staff and volunteers that we believe that having um, consistent people, even amongst our volunteers is better than having a ton of volunteers. Mm -hmm. That, you know, having specific specific trained people who are passionate about what you do. They're passionate about um, healthcare for, the, for vulnerable populations that then really you get a real buy-in that really pays off in the outcomes for your patients. So um, if, if, you're, if, if you're having trouble um, manning your clinic, it, either in volunteers um, 
then you might need to think about what kind of staff that you might can raise the money for. And um, Teresa is not paid excessively. Um, I am not paid excessively, um, but we make what we need to. And so you can you you can find the money to pay people um, a, a fair market value and also um, run a tight ship that that many nonprofits have to run. So a lot of my patients will say, "Where else do you work?" And I I find it a joy and a privilege to say this is the only place I, this is where I work this is my office you are my patient mm -hmm. and um you know I'm focused on you and your health and you're going to see me every time you come yeah that's that's a wonderful blessing so so uh, another thing we do is we leverage our donations. We know this in the nonprofit world that we that we have to say yes. And um, sometimes I don't want to. Sometimes people give us stuff I don't want. Um, but I but I recognize ultimately that um, there there is usually beneficial things that um, kind of I kind of have that philosophy that um, God will give you all you need as long as you don't get sticky hands. And so we just let it kind of move through us. And so. Um, um, we we definitely have done that with durable medical equipment that we've been really um, willing to take it um, and then also work with other organizations that we might know who could use it or who could get it better into the hands of other people. It does take work. It does it does mean I always have something in my basement at home I'm trying to get rid of or. You know, um, I have a, a company that I know of that ships things out to an international organization. So like after COVID, we got tons of donations of needles, you know, pe people had, you know, more needles than they knew what to do with after the vaccine. Right. And so we we really shipped those out um, to an organization that shipped them internationally. So it is taking on partnerships. If I'll circle back to people, I think I kind of talked about that in the last slide, but you we we personally don't take volunteers that are currently patients, but we can use them to do other things. So uh, to help us with events or um, to do odd jobs around the clinic. Um, we've recently moved, so we needed blinds hung and we needed some handyman services. And many of the rehabs that um, we take care of them, they were able to help us with those kind of things. So say, so say yes to the things that people offer you. People want to help you. They want to give things to you. Um, and it, it is rewarding for them to be able Able to say yes. I also um, really believe in never having a volunteer that you don't have something for them to do because it's not very rewarding for them. So you just really want to make sure that um, you keep people busy and that you stay grateful and um, write those thank you cards and um, and say yes when people offer. Um, of course, there are major um, uh, donation organizations that many of you may be aware of, AmeriCare's Direct Relief um, Medication Assistance Program based out of Atlanta that works a lot in the Southeast. And But there are organizations that you, you need their donations in order to really, really function. Uh, the Hope Dispensary is not free, but um, Dispensary of Hope, but that is also something um, uh, that you can utilize. And the truth is, is I think we gave out about $3.8 million worth of medications out of our medication closet, um, our dispensary last year. So you, it, this is a huge blessing to our patients. So you, you want to say yes to donations. Um, and then this just allowing patients to give back. These are just some of the functions that we do. Um, we don't actually put on um, a Hispanic fundraiser. About half of our patients are undocumented Spanish speaking immigrants and um, they host a, a fundraiser themselves and they donate the funds to us. So Teresa spends a lot of time there that day. Mm -hmm. uh, Teresa is bilingual. And so, um, but they do a great job and it's, it, uh, it is rewarding to them to give back to us. It's great PR for us amongst their community. And um, it's something we really feel special to be uh, a part of. Uh, we are currently even right now um, filming across our, our campus today because we um, are getting our annual promotional videos together. So we've had uh, patients give testimonies and participate in those videos. And then um, just something we recently uh, participated in is having patient representatives for our um, 
important for our board. So you want to involve patients as much as you can, uh, because in this, th this is, we, I always say it's a professional medical clinic, but we are a ministry and ministries are, are based on volunteers and a, a, a generous spirit of giving back. And so we want to help our patients to do that. And then uh, this is, I, I, I would say finally, that you need to leverage the solutions that your clinic has to offer. Um, this has been a really pivotal thing for me to work in the nonprofit world. I came, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a nurse by background. I worked in outpatient community setting for, for many years. And when I came here, <clears throat> I felt like the clinic was in need, like our patients were in need. And I started to realize, um, you know, first off, that we needed to be really, really careful with our resources, which is why I have the first statement, which is we don't duplicate services. We didn't start doing hep C until the HIV clinic that used to handle it stopped handling it. Um, we, if, if somebody else does something, we try not to do the same thing. Now, that may not be true in a big town. So we, we're in a smaller town and um, there are limited resources. If you're in a larger town, you may duplicate services because there may be so many people that you have to in order to take care of vulnerable populations. But in our town, we don't have a prescription assistance program because there's another major organization that is not just a few blocks away that has a full-time employee that handles prescription, prescription assistance programs. So we just have to work closely with them. And yes, it is another stop for our patients, but it's another stop that, um, it's a stop that our patients would um, make because they do other types of relief work. And so it's an easy place for them to go. And it, it's safe. Why should I employ somebody to do that or do the paperwork for it when someone, another agency that we can work together? So think collaborative partnerships. The next thing is, is that cities are looking for solutions for the problems that your city and um, your community faces. And so what I feel like is that we offer a solution. Um, I, we work very closely with our hospital and with our city. And we do that because we offered them a solution. We said, if you will um, uh, help us, we will help the indigent. Like you don't have to worry about people who are uninsured. If you have uninsured people being released from the hospital and they need primary care, you you can refer them to us. We want you to do that. And because we just said yes to every meeting, we said yes to every opportunity. This especially happened during COVID. We, we said, please give us the patients that you don't know what to do with, the homeless, the vulnerable, the undocumented, the Spanish speaking. We, we will handle those patients. So don't think about it just as like, man, you really need somebody to help you, but recognize that you have a solution to offer your community. And in doing so, yes, it may bring resources to you, but you also have a legitimate seat at the table. Um, people want to invest in success. If they know that you're taking care of people, that you're doing it well, they will invest in you. The, the money is there, but you will have to know your data. Uh, when I came, there, there was a paltry amount of data when I first started. And it was because, you know, there wasn't a really a person to do that. There wasn't you know, a person outside of the front desk and a provider. So you might need other people, but you got to start keeping those stats. Um, you utilize your EHR as much as you can to get that. Um, you might have to keep, um, you know, some Excel sheets and you might have to keep some written data. Teresa does some writing for me. We just can't find a different way um, to log some information than just for her to write it. But you you need those things because at the end of the year, you got to be able to um, produce some numbers and let people know the success that you've experienced over the year. And then finally, I, I would just say, this is us outside of our new building, which we moved into in November of 2023. And this building behind us is um, probably three times the size of our previous clinic. Um, it is a, uh, owned by the city of Anniston, where we um, work and reside. And uh, in honor of a, of a local medical hero, Dr. David Satcher, who is from Anniston, Alabama, and who was the first African-American Surgeon General. Our city wanted to honor him. Um, they wanted to utilize this building and they wanted us to take care of the indigent. And so we have this building lease free. Um, we gained an exam room and 
um, a whole host of um, space that we did not have before. And, and we also uh, entered a, a formal partnership with our local hospital uh, for them to invest funds into us as well. So I, I just can't say enough that when you say yes, when you leverage your resources, when you leverage your solutions, that you can have a really big impact in your community. And, and we and you didn't we go to them begging for the yeah, building or right. any, any of this. And they just kept inviting Nanette to some meetings. Can you come to this? Can you come to that? And all of a sudden she realized they're courting me. They want us to help. The city wants us to help. The, the, the hospital wants our help. And and so that's kind of how God did that for us. And so uh, really in this picture is, is Dr. David Satcher and every major city official in our city, along with physicians and leaders in our community. And so really when, when you do what God calls you to do, he makes a way and he really allows you to take what little you have and then he multiplies it. So we believe that your maybe small clinic can really have a big impact too. And that's what we pray and hope and believe will happen for you as well. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you.